when it comes to moralistic framing, okay, what happens is somebody's talking to you with a data package. Like I want to present, I want to shove this down your throat, like this systematic theology. Here you go. I'm trying to get you to accept this data as true. But in you see, in, instead of having a an epistemic threshold of what you consider to be true, like what what will it get to get you? What will it take to get you to believe something is true and adopt it and accept it and then be on board with that thing, okay? You would think that you have an epistemic threshold, like you have to meet these proofs with me, but that's actually not true because almost anybody's epistemic threshold can be bypassed and hacked, if you will, cracked if you want to use the technical term, it can be bypassed and hacked moralistically. So if your epistemic threshold is high, which it should be, we can completely bypass that and get around it by taking a moral road to get you to believe the thing that they want you to believe. I want you to believe this version of systematic theology they can bypass your epistemic thresholds and go around them and take a moral road and get you there. Now, that is use, that is somebody exploiting the way the human body is made and using it against you. Because if it was just down to the data, you would probably turn down a lot of things that you have come to believe over the years. But people get to us and they cause us to affirm things not because of a data threshold or a truth claim proof level type of threshold, but because of a moral inroad, a moral backdoor. Imagine that you're a computer program or a piece of software that has a backdoor, okay? Imagine everybody, you know, huh, if we were all cybernetic, everyone's afraid if we become cybernetic and we start implanting things into our body, uh, people become afraid that somebody's going to hack them. What if somebody gets control of me, remote control? Well, they can actually do that right now, you see, except there's no technology involved. Well, there's tech know-how, but but it's moralistic manipulation. And you have a backdoor. Imagine you're a piece of hardware and you have a backdoor into your software set. And that backdoor into your software set, and there's there's many of them, but one of them is morality. You're moralistic, you can be moralistically manipulated and then essentially more or less remote controlled by an ideological entity like Calvinism or provisionism or Mormonism or something like that, okay? And what I want to do in this session is to get you to recognize when that is happening so that you can, this, to, in other words, if you can match, master what I'm trying to tell you today, you can patch that vulnerability so that it can't be exploited by a malicious threat actor. Because there's malicious threat actors out there who want to occupy you as territory. And the avenue of approach to get in your mind is not an epistemic threshold. They think you present it that way. But it's actually a moralistic inroad that they use to hack you. And now they have control of you. And like Joe says... They aim for the elephant, not his rider. Exactly. So when you know the difference between the elephant and the rider, which we'll talk about a little bit today, I have some slides on this right here. Yeah. They'll they'll aim for the elephant. And so I'm glad you brought that up, Joe, so we can talk about that. So what happens is they have a data package, like the payload is data, Calvinism. For example, we talk about Calvinism a lot on this channel. The, the data payload may be the Calvinism data set, okay? And it may come in a book like this. Well, Calvinism does not, does not meet any sound epistemic thresholds of proof, okay? Doesn't, doesn't meet any of them. So they have to get to you moralistically. There has to be some kind of manipulative inroad to get you into Calvinism. There has to be uh, some framing tricks involved in order to get people into Calvinism because if everybody was good, if everybody was a good epistemologist, there would be no Calvinism, okay? The only way something like Calvinism can spread is if people are not good epistemologists and we can bypass their epistemology, hopefully they're unaware of their own epistemology, 
and we can use moralism to get around that. And so that's what we're looking at today. These two things, moralistic manipulation is very, very subtle. It's very subtle and it can be difficult to spot. However, if detected, a manipulator can be completely disarmed. Once you realize what's going on, once you know what to listen for, once you hear the phrases and you have your, your epistemic threshold of proof antenna up and running, you'll notice very strongly when something doesn't meet it. And we'll look at some examples today. Each earnest and conscientious person, that would be you and me, each earnest and conscientious person must be a diligent custodian of the information ecology, okay? So you're constantly scanning the information that's going back and forth that's intended for you or that's intended for people that you know, and you're scanning it to see if it meets the epistemic thresholds that would be required in order for somebody to, to rightly believe in it, okay? And so if you notice something that, if you notice something is packaged, is delivered in a vehicle of moralism, you should know right away, your red flag should go up and your radar should start sounding off that there's something wrong here. Uh, something, something bad is going on. They always like to, I always like to package things very beautifully and bring you, and that's what kids do with breakfast cereals, you see? You know that breakfast cereals for kids, they're, they're terrible for you. They're full of sugar and the, and the wheat and the gluten and all. It's just, it's just bad for you. It's uh, all the simple carbohydrates, the junk food. It's, it's, as bad, it's about as bad for you as it can possibly be. But they attract you to it by getting on your salience landscape through other ways. They don't try to sell it as the healthiest thing. They try to sell it on taste, not health. They try to sell it. The box is fun. Maybe it's... Uh, the box is, you know, patterned after a cartoon that the kid watches. All kinds of things other than the reason we should be eating are is how this thing is packaged. And things like Calvinism, ide ideology, are packaged in a way to cause it to be appealing, even though the thing we're putting in our mind is just absolutely terrible for us and everybody else. So we want to watch out for that. So those two things right there, we must be diligent custodian of the information ecology. You don't have an option, okay? You can just either be manipulated like everybody else or you can be this. And then, so understand that it's subtle and understand that when a manipulator comes your way, if you know how to look for these things, you can actually completely disarm uh, a manipulator, which is what we want to do. We want to disarm them and remove their potency and effectiveness. There's some biblical warnings, say, in Ephesians 4.14, by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. It's, the deception isn't just an untruth. It is cunning and crafty, you see? In 2 Peter 2, when it's talking about these false teachers, in verse 3, and through covetousness, they with feigned words shall make merchandise of you, okay? I'm trying to get my... Uh, my pen out here. They with, they with through through covetousness. They with feigned words shall make merchandise of you. You are your mind, you body, you you are just territory that they want the egregore of Calvinism or provisionism to occupy, to conquer, to overcome. Okay, that's all you are. Is you're just territory to be overcome, to be occupied. And through covetousness of this territory and what you bring with you, maybe spending power and tithing and all this kind of stuff or whoever it is, with feigned words, they're going to make merchandise of you. And these, so the bad guys don't come along speaking great, uh, horrible, obvious lies. It's very subtle. In Romans 16, 18, by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. 
not horrible words and terrible speeches, good words, fair speeches. That's how it's done. They dress up nice. They look clean. They look articulate. You get the halo effect. They're successful in other areas of their life. They look good, clean, moral, and righteous, and they are manipulating you. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God in 2 Second Corinthians 2.17. Okay, but as of sincerity and as in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. I can to corrupt the word of God. I could get you to, I could use moralistic reasons to get you to believe something that it doesn't say under the guise of this is what it teaches. You see, it teaches this. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So there are people handling, they're walking in the hidden, the dishonest, they're walking in craftiness, handling the word of God deceitfully. So this, oh, Calvinism is biblical. Calvinism is drifting off every page of scripture. And, and they'll, they'll, Calvinist, but they use all these Bible verses. They're handling the word of God deceitfully. In 2 Timothy 3, 5 through 7, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, listen, this phrase here, diverse lusts, I know you're tempted to think of drinking, smoking, and fornicating and all that kind of thing. But I don't think that's what's going on. I really don't. Once you understand how the, how the human body works as a data processor, okay, we tend to overestimate ourselves as data processors and analyzers. However, there are so many factors, like we think, oh, I have a high threshold of epistemic proof requirement before I'm willing to affirm something is true. We think that about ourselves, but actually it's not the case for, for hardly any of us. There are so many factors affecting us that our truth claim affirmations are almost never objective. They're almost never unaffected or truly data-driven in an unbiased way. In other words, you have all kinds of biases inside you don't even know you have. In other words, we have countless covert biases that are always at play and that can be exploited by external stimuli to include malicious manipulative actors. Okay. So for example, some things make you comfortable that can be exploited to make you believe something. You might have certain preferences. I like things that are blue or purple or things that taste like cinnamon that can be exploited. Things that are familiar to you. A lot of people choose a terrible spouse because the way they behave is familiar with some kind of uh, toxic, dis dysfunctional uh, behavior that they're familiar with, maybe from one of their parents or a previous relationship. It's familiar. It's the devil you know. In-group belonging. In-group hier hierarchical ranking. Well, I want to be a member of this place. I want these people to accept me. And I would like to maybe be a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or something like that or an elder or, you know, you never know. Uh, peer pressure. And this goes in with in-group belonging, but peer pressure. And, you know, they say you always hear this for children, but people succumb to peer pressure all the time at all ages. Values. What are your values? So if I, if I'm, if I know you're a Christian, I already know that you value being humble you value giving God the glory. You value saying that God is in control. You value not being prideful. You value being honest. See, I already know what your values are if you're a Christian. So if I want to deceive you, instead of meeting an epistemic threshold of truth for the payload that I want you to affirm is true, I just have to appeal to those values. I just have to make you feel like you're humble if you believe them. I have to make you feel like you're giving God the glory if you believe them. You see, if I can make you feel, and that's one of the problems with ideology. It causes people to feel more righteous for affirming the ideology while also making them less effective. And that's Christianity today. It's people who feel righteous and virtuous 
for all the things that they affirm, but who are actually ineffective when it comes to doing anything meaningful in life. Okay? And that's just about all of evangelicalism. Right there. It's worth checking our motives and agendas like being uh, like being liked or whatever that put, put us in these vulnerable spots. Yes, absolutely. The problem is people don't people aren't willing to admit to themselves that that's why they are caving into something. Okay. Uh, you may have certain morals, which we will talk about very specifically. Your, your limbic system drives, like your limbic system is constantly you want to eat, or maybe you want to flee if something is dangerous, or maybe you want to fight if something's dangerous. Or mating, it's funny, there's a textbook that puts these three, these four things here together and calls them the four Fs of the limbic system. I will let you figure that out. And then there's also freezing and fawning. So there's actually six of these things that all come from the limbic system. There's probably more. But the idea is that your limbic system causes you to react in certain ways. And if I know what those are, I can exploit those if I know what your other things are. Physical pain, we want to avoid that. We have previous wounds and baggage. And then we also have previous good experiences. If I know what those are, I can exploit those to get you to believe something or do something. Uh, physical pain, nobody wants that. Personal profile, your disposition, okay? Your personality profile, uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. Where, How strong and weak are you in those areas, okay? Whatever that personality profile is. If I know that you're highly conscientious, I will make it feel like it's the right thing to do to believe what I'm telling you. If I know that you're highly neurotic and don't want to be, I will tell you that this will make you joyful, okay? That, that sort of thing. So if I can assess your personality profile, I, I'll know how to get to you. If I want to manipulate you. And then your disposition, what kind of, you know, what kind of attitude do you typically have most of the time? Your hormones and chemicals that are pumping through your body, your food, sugar, carbs, protein, those all make you feel different ways. I noticed that when I drink, I used to have a problem drinking sugary sodas a lot. And I noticed when I did that, I would feel sad afterwards. I never, I never and I, I, it took me a while to piece that together, right? And so all these different things affect you in different ways. And you may not even realize what you're doing. Your gut health very much affects how your brain works, okay? You got to keep your gut in good health. Procedural knowledge, how knowing how to do something. And then there's custom traditions and norms. Now, this slide could be 75 feet long. And we could do that without repeating any of these. But um, Joey, a few minutes ago, talked about the elephant and the rider. And that idea comes from this book, okay? The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And basically, in a nutshell, what's going on is all of this stuff is like an elephant. All of this stuff is like an elephant. And there's more too. But it's all like an elephant and you're the rider. And the analogy that he gives in the book is the elephant decides where to go, and then the rider thinks that he decided where to go. And then the elephant smells something else and starts chasing a peanut, and the rider thinks that he decided to go chase the peanuts. Okay, The rider thinks he's in charge. The rider is not in charge. Your prefrontal cortex, your higher level of thinking. Now, it is possible to get your rider in charge, but for most people, it is not. <clears throat> for most people, this elephant that I have circled here, this is what's making all the decisions. And after these influencers make the decision, you think you made the decision. So there is a degree, you know, Calvinists are real hard on the idea of free will. And when it when it comes to how most people make decisions, they they kind of have a point. Now, I don't think they deterministically or doctrinally have a point, but practically... Uh, most people are making decisions not because something achieved some kind of epistemic proof threshold to them, but because something that appeals to one of these areas was made salient, and that's what becomes relevant to them. If you understand how relevance realization works, you can start <clears throat> choosing and opting what becomes relevant to you rather based on what you think you should aim for rather than some of these other influences. So in the book, Jonathan Haidt, all, all these kinds of things basically constitute an elephant that you're riding. And you're, this, this elephant of all these things is what's making all the decisions 
for what to do, what to believe, who to hang out with, what to eat. And then you think you're making those decisions. And for most people, most of the time, you are not the one making the decisions. So what we want to do is figure out how we can get people from exploiting this elephant to make decisions that we don't want it to make, to be the writer that's actually in charge is what we want it to do. So some things to watch out for. I'm not, I'm not going to read every one of these, but I am going to um, just highlight a few of them and just tell you what they are. Appealing to emotion. And now the second one is you're going to watch for these things, but then the next slide I'm going to show you is mitigating for subtlety. Okay, because if, they, if someone just appeals to emotion, you might catch that. How does this make you feel? Oh, if it makes you feel good, you should buy my product, that sort of thing. Of course, no one's going to fall for that. So all of these things, they don't just come out and say these things. It's very subtly tucked away, very subtly tucked away into how, how the things are framed. Okay, And they act like they're presenting data to you but then it's framed in a moralistic way to get you to jump on with it. Now, what we're calling NERC, we call it non-epistemic ranking criteria is essentially very similar to what is what is known as Lakoff framing. George Lakoff, okay? Lakoff framing is based on the work of linguist and cognitive scientist George Lakoff. It's a concept that explores how language shapes the way we understand and interact with the world. Lakoff posits that our mental structures and thought processes are significantly influenced by the frames through which we perceive information. A frame is a mental structure that shapes the way we see the world and understand concepts. In the context of politics, social issues, and communication, frames are used to convey a perspective or interpretation of reality that aligns with a certain values or viewpoints. And I hope that even though he's talking about politics, social issues, and communications here, I hope you understand that we can translate that over to theological issues as well. Lakoff argues that the framing of issues can profoundly affect public opinion and the political landscape. For, for instance, the way a political issue is framed can influence individuals' perceptions, potentially leading them to support policies or positions that align with the framing. Lakoff's work emphasizes the strategic use of language and framing in political discourse, suggesting that the battle over public opinion is often a battle for which frames will dominate the narrative around an issue, which would likely be the case in theology as well. Now, we think, oh, I've got, just, we, what we do to get around this, we resort to magical thinking, stage two. What do you mean stage two? Fowler's thinking stage two, purple, beige, red, magical thinking, spiral dynamics, purple, beige, red, magical thinking. Oh, the Holy Ghost gave me discernment, so I don't have to worry about framing. The Holy Ghost will guide me into truth because I have read, you know, John 16, 13, and that kind of thing. And God will protect me, this sort of stuff. Um, this channel is how God is helping lead you into truth by protecting yourself. I'm not saying I am the utterer of truth. What I'm saying is that distributed cognition of us helping each other, the Ephesians 4.16 edification model is one of the things that, that we help each other with, okay? So framing in theological matters, framing determines, like James Ross, you got to hand it to that dude over at uh, First Baptist Church on Bayou. He used framing to turn a church into a Calvinist church over a course of about five years. He did it, okay? Okay. In a church that specifically said they did not want a Calvinist pastor. He did it. How? Framing. Framing. And we've covered, we've looked at all the videos. We show the stuff. And we may have some more coming up as well. So if the example here in the political realm, for example, the term tax relief frames taxes as an affliction from which people need relief, inherently suggesting a negative view of taxation. 
According to Lakoff, understanding and employing effective frames is crucial for people, political communication, and for influencing how issues are perceived and discussed in the public sphere. So I hope you can translate that, pick that up out of the political realm where George Lakoff operates and realize that this same thing is going on in theology. Now, he didn't put it there. George Lakoff is not the person who put it there. This stuff's been going on for you know centuries before he was born. It's just happening, and he just happens to point it out. And it's also happening in, in the theological realm, and all we're doing is pointing it out. What are some examples? Here's here are some examples from the YouTube from yesterday's video and from recent YouTube videos within the past couple of weeks. This one up here. It's very telling that I didn't hear any scripture in this video so far. See what just happened there? It's very telling. I didn't hear any scripture in this video so far. So now we're immoral because we didn't meet somebody's criteria to have have scripture in there. But it's very common for children, cluster B personality disorders, and uh, ideologues to create some kind of acute, immediate requirement or standard that you have to meet in order for them to validate that what you're doing is valid. Like suddenly, okay, we're doing a YouTube video. Suddenly you must present scripture or I don't think you're valid or moral. You must present the gospel. Okay. That kind of thing. And so what that does is this is why people who have people who are like this, You'll notice that when you're around ideologues like narcissistic, spiritual, abusive people, or when you're around somebody who's got a cluster B personality disorder, maybe you're married to them, a narcissist, borderline personality disorder, histrionic, antisocial personality disorder, what you'll notice is it feels like walking on eggshells all the time. And the reason for that is because they can invent a requirement out of thin air of something you didn't do and then hold you in contempt for it right away. Like you're somehow less moralistically viable because you didn't do something that I just noticed and made up, okay? So for example, a guy might take his wife out to dinner and he arranges a very nice restaurant and they're all dressed up and there's reservations and there's candlelight and all this and they show up and they're eating and she's upset because You didn't even get me flowers. You know, here here the guy, he thinks he's winning, right? He thinks he's treating his woman like a queen and doing it right. But she's going to find something that he didn't do, okay? That's That's a possible sign of mental illness. And when these guys are like, I didn't hear any scripture so far. I didn't hear this. I didn't hear you get the gospel so far. They're, They're pointing out things that, you're not doing that they suddenly have the right to demand that you should have done if you're going to be valid in their eyes, okay? We don't need you in our life. So if that's you, just go on with yourself somewhere. And that's why the book Walking on Eggshells, that's why that book exists, because that is the kind of thing that goes on. They just invent this thing. This one says, uh, you should be focusing on Jesus, not, and then whatever it is you're talking about. They could do it on this video. And then the blank is filled in with whatever topic is being discussed. Or they'll say something like, this doesn't bring God any glory. Or this doesn't attribute the glory to God. And we've talked many times about, several times recently, about how these myopic people, they want you to pay lip service to giving glory to God. You know, the Bible says, love not in word only, but in deed and in truth. We believe in glory to giving glory to God and how we live. So when we have the conversation, I might not say glory to God in that conversation. I might not say solo deo gloria when I sign my email or at the end of my Facebook posts. But if I'm being loving, John 13, 35, and I'm being wise in my interactions with people, that brings more glory to God than just paying it lip service. 
especially if I do it consistent, consistently over a protracted amount of time, okay? So if I had multiple conversations and the, when this came up, there, you know, it was when we had Kayla and Nick on, and I'm like, well, we may not have said glory be to God, solo deo gloria in the middle of this video, but maybe two or three years from now, Kayla behaves very wisely in a relationship that she has as a result of having conversations like this one. What? What's wrong with bringing glory to God that way? So what we're looking at is the operational horizon, okay? Can you bring glory to God over a protracted amount of time, a month, a year, five years, a decade, or are you just going to show up and say it and just pay lip service to it, which I don't think is actually bringing glory to God. I think that's taking the name, the, the Lord's name in vain, actually. You say glory to God and you're not living it? You're taking the Lord's name in vain, and you will not be held guiltless for that. You say, well, I thought it was taking, you know, using it as a curse. No, no, not at all. You want to pay lip service to it. So I've been in situations where we gave God all the glory verbally. Everyone shows up, everyone's shouting and hollering, everyone's saying glory to God. And then not long later, not only does the whole family fall apart, but all the families of everybody there all fall apart. All of them all fall apart. Just absolute dysfunction in every direction. Just a scatter, absolute scatter. Does that bring glory to God? We all showed up and we paid lip service to it. And then everybody got divorced and committed suicide and became a wicked and everything else. Okay, so how much glory does that bring to God? So I just, it sickens me. When people want a a my <laughs> some kind of myopic tribute to God or some kind of myopic focus on Jesus, Jesus is a way. Okay, just because I'm not mentioning Jesus's name as the topic of discussion at any given time, doesn't mean that I'm not behaving in the way that is Christ for what is needed in the situation in which I find myself. So when these guys make these comments, they're just they're just full of beans, you know. <laughs> just I don't have the time for it because it's moralistic. It's moralistic statements. If you don't accept the doctrine of election, you are accusing God of injustice. Now you think that I'm making that up, but we just played a Calvinist preacher who actually said that. We just played it. But if you do not believe that you do not believe in God's sovereign grace, you are, in fact, indicting God. This is dangerous ground. You are, in fact, accusing God of injustice. And in Romans chapter 9, it makes it very clear that you're on shaky ground. The Calvinists really talk that way. It's really that bad. Yeah. Yesterday, when I was talking to Alana on the channel, one of the complaints that came to her was like oh you got your views from youtube which wasn't the case but you see how that's moralistically loaded it's there's an air of invalidating that doesn't meet any kind of epistemic threshold of proof So Augustine built an entire dogmatic system from the premise of total depravity, which is a negation of free, free will. Calvinists, you know, we talked about it earlier. So they're negating free, free, total depravity is their label for there not being any free, free will. Okay. Now, remember, we're not advocating free will. I'm okay with free will or no free will being a derivative of sound axioms. But I do not believe in starting with either free will or no free will as an axiomatic starting place. Do you understand the difference? So when we look back at our videos for don't argue for free will, and it's not about free will, and Calvinists using free will as a straw man, listen, non-Calvinists, you have to get this. 
If you're ever going to wake up Calvinists and help them see that their problem is with Scripture, not with these little philosophical things, you have to get away from the battery. You can't, you can't be going to the same battery and prove somebody wrong. You can't, you know, if you, <laughs> if this battery is a boat and they're on one end and you're on the other end and you chop the boat down and blow it up, you sink too, you see? So you're not going to make any headway by arguing for free will because you're just taking the positive end of the same wrong battery. Problem is the battery is the wrong battery. It's the wrong battery. You need something else. You need to get rid of that entirely. That cannot be the starting point. So Augustine built an entire dogmatic system from the premise of total depravity, which is a negation of free, free will. So these things cascade from each other. If you start with the Pelagian premise, the, the negative end of the Pelagian premise, total depravity, okay? The negative end of the Pelagian premise here. You start with the Pelagian premise on the negative end, say total depravity. What that we under, that's really just singular depravity. It just really means at the end of the day that you can't receive Jesus Christ as your savior. That's, that's all it means. And so they're like, okay. Well, the person can't receive Jesus Christ as their savior. Well, then who, where's the deciding factor? You know, what's the, what's the touchstone for who receives Jesus Christ? That, that's a legitimate question. And the answer to that is post hoc rationalized. Okay. So I have that written down on purpose like that. Let's see if I can. Erase this. Erase all ink on the slide. There we go. So the post hoc, all of these are post hoc rationalized from the adoption of the negative end of the Pelagian premise. They didn't, they didn't go to the Bible and get unconditional election. Every choosing in the Bible has a condition to it. You ever read 1 Corinthians 1? God hath not chosen the wise and the noble things of this world, but he has chosen the lowly and the foolish things of this world, the weak things of this world, those are conditions, you see? Those are conditions. There's no unconditional election. Nobody ever read their Bible and found unconditional election. You have to have unconditional election. It has to come from this cascade first, and then your salience landscaping is conditioned to make you think you see it in Scripture because your everything you perceive is not actually what you perceive. It's your left hemisphere reconstructing something to match a map that you think exists of reality. To reify something is to confuse the map for the territory. Okay, you take a map and you make it more authoritative than the territory itself. If you're walking through the woods and your map says there's no creek here, but there actually is water running in front of you, which one is true? Well, the actual water on the real terrain running in front of you, that's what's true. And if the map doesn't have that, it's wrong. Well, in Calvinism land, the map is correct regardless of what the actual terrain is. So, so in Calvinism, there's no way to update the paradigm. There's no way to update the map. They're, they are moralistically attached to the map in this way where if you disagree with the map, there's something wrong with you morally, you see? And nobody wants anything to be wrong with them morally so they have centuries and centuries of people taking the map over the terrain. So unconditional election cascades from total depravity. So if so, what is the deciding factor? If the person can't receive Jesus Christ, what's the deciding factor? Unconditional election is a post hoc rationalization mixed with Augustine's Manichaean Gnosticism. Okay, that too, because election comes from Manichaean Gnosticism too. That kind of Gnostic election does, not biblical election. And so to take the cat. Now, remember, you don't have to go to scripture for any of this. You can just go to the Pelagian controversy and start asking questions. If, total, if, if you just ask questions, the obvious questions that come if these things are true, then you get all of Calvinism. You get all the Calvinist distinctives just by watching how they logically cascade 
and they develop from each other from post hoc rationalization. None of these come from scripture. None of Calvinism was built from scripture up. None of it, ever. Not one single time ever. We say, well, one time I was, yeah, but you sat in church for years and sang songs like nothing but the blood for a long time and had a preacher talking about penal substitutionary atonement. You didn't realize you were being pre-programmed to fall for Calvinism to make yourself think that you see it when you're in scripture. But you you were basically affected with a logic bomb virus in your head that caused things to look Calvinistic to you when triggered with certain buzzwords. Seen it happen over and over again. They teach somebody the, the Augustinian version of predestination rather than the biblical version. And then they argue positive or negative over the wrong battery again. And everyone walks away either being positive or negative on Augustinian election. They don't know that there's another version of elect of or predestination. They don't know that there's another version of predestination that is not Augustinian. Later on, they're reading their chapter a day to keep the devil away, and they come across Ephesians 1, and they see the word predestinated without any context and without understanding the historical, without any context of scripture and without understanding the historical context from which Augustine developed his doctrine. They say, oh, there's the word predestinated. I guess predestination is true. And what they really mean is Augustinian predestination is true when it's not. Happens all the time. That's how people become Calvinists. They have, they essentially have a computer virus stored in their head. I was just talking to somebody today about how a lot of non-Calvinism has retained, you know, or you could say it this way. Because Calvinism has been around for so many centuries, just like the second grade has been, it has leaked out into non-Calvinist assemblies, non-Calvinist, the non-Calvinist world. And so there's a lot of the non-Calvinist world that retains Calvinistic presumptions. And these are like logic bombs, or like zero-day viruses. When a certain thing comes and hits you, bam, you start to think Calvinism is true. You think you got out of Scripture, and you don't realize that you had a computer virus in your mind from how you were conditioned before you read that. Okay? Kevin, are you saying I'm stupid? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was stupid. I fell for it, and the only reason you can become a Calvinist is if you're stupid, and I was stupid, and if you're a Calvinist, you're stupid too. If you've ever been a Calvinist, you were stupid while you were a Calvinist. Some people leave Calvinism, and they say they stay stupid in other ways, okay? So we don't advocate stupidity around here, but yes. So, okay, so if God chooses unconditionally before the foundation of the world and all that nonsense, okay? I said nonsense because they leave out the in him. Calvinists can't seem to quote the end. They can't seem to remember the in him in Ephesians 1.4 because that really throws them for a loop, especially after you read Ephesians 2.12. They were not in Christ before the foundation of the world because otherwise, because they're very clearly before they were saved, they were not in Christ. Ephesians 2.12 makes that abundantly clear, undeniably clear. And so you have this situation where the person has to have been in Christ in Ephesians 1.4 before the foundation of the world, and then somehow they fell out and then Christ had to go seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10. And then somehow find again the people who have been in Christ since before the foundation of the world. Now, that's not the dumbest thing you ever heard in your life. Yes, Calvinist, if you're if you're consistent, that's what the text demands happened. Okay? But you don't have to believe Calvinism. Okay? Stupidity can be fixed. Well, ignorance can be fixed. They say ignorance can be fixed. Stupidity is forever. If your problem is ignorance, we can fix it. If your problem is stupidity, you know, have a nice life. Elizabeth says, I feel stupid for having been a Calvinist. And I share that feeling with you. Yes, I was absolutely stupid as well. So we uh, advocate not being stupid. So, okay, so God chose people for, God chose people to unconditionally elect them to salvation, which is not biblical election at all. What if they don't want to go? Too bad, they're irresistibly forced, and they cannot resist it. And they, you know, we've never read Acts chapter 7, verse 52 and 53. Always uh, <laughs> resist the Holy Ghost. 
but they it's a post see it's a post hoc rationalization that didn't come from any scriptures no scripture that says any of these these are all post hoc rationalized from each other they say okay what if they didn't you know god chose them and they've been irresistibly graced into it but what if they're not into it and they don't really they know they just want to live like the devil and go live in a lascivious life all the time well Another post-talk rationalism. Well, if they're really saved, no true Scotsman fallacy. If they're really saved, they will persevere in faith and, and good works, as we define it, by the way. It's called lordship salvation. It's a backdoor to work salvation. They gotta, they're gonna find some way to control people. And, and the back door. See. Now, notice the L is not there. The L doesn't come till the early ninth century by a guy named Goschal. Okay, but all these four points. You could be an Amarildian or whatever from a uh, Amaraldian, however you pronounce it, just from Augustine, from Augustine's post hoc rationalizations. Now, limited atonement does not necessarily flow from cascade from these, but it is another point that if it is presumed, the rest of these also cascade from it. Okay. So the entire system, none of it comes from scripture. It is all post hoc rationalized from the Pelagian adoption of the uh, from the adoption of the negative end of the Pelagian premise. So Augustine takes the same battery that Pelagius has, and he just takes the other end of the same battery, presumption of the human will, and builds an entire system off it. So that entire system is more Pelagian than it is. It's it's Pelagianism mixed with Manichaean Gnosticism. So the third one is what we're going to call tone policing. Okay, and in tone policing, you're going to have ideological moralism, Christian political correctness. You're going to avoid the substance and attack the deliverer's tone. They're going to get you on procedure. So when we do these videos with, say, Marsha and Debbie, you'll see people in the comments saying, "Did you, did you go talk to them personally?" And I'm like, "Look." They tried to talk to them for five years. Ah. Cinque. Cinque anos. Okay. I'm not speaking Spanish. I'm speaking Italian. I'm probably doing that wrong too. But they, five years. Five years. So instead of actually addressing what you're saying, instead of listening to the video and seeing what a horrible fool this clown is, they're like, did you go talk to him? All these Karens show up, okay? Tone policing, a bunch of Karens, okay? Same kind of people that tell you you got to wear a mask during COVID. At our house, we call them face panties. Got to wear your face panties during COVID. Same kind of people that just love to make other people wear them. They just love, love, love some reason to make people do things and make people do things a certain way, okay? You're doing it wrong. And so what they want to do is they want to put all kinds of procedural red tape. Well, we want you to meet with the deacons. Oh, you didn't do it right. You have to go to one person first, then two, then take a friend, and then you bring it before the deacon board. Then you come over here, and then uh, we'll bring it up before the church next Tuesday. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a song about that. I woke up and went to church one Sunday. And then he says, and I stood up and told the congregation uh, he, something about he smells a smoke. So, or a torn, yeah, he smells smoke. So he's he's like, I stood up and told the congregation, there's a fire here, it's everybody run. And they said that the point will put in a timely suggestion and we'll bring it up at the very next meeting of the Board of Deacons a week from Tuesday. I don't know why, it's just church policy. At the first as a method, Baptocostal, Seventh-day Orthodox, Lutheran, non-denominational, Church of Our Lady of the Mind. And then the next week, it's tor next week it's something else, a tornado, and they're meeting in a tent. And then the next week, they're having an open-air meeting on the ground. And then, and then he says he hears the trumpet sound, and it's the rapture. And they said, that's a point well put and a timely suggestion, and we'll bring it up at the very next meeting of the Board of Deacons, that kind of thing. 
In other words, the point of the song is that you have so much process in place that you're absolutely useless and meaningless. And so you'll find if you were to talk to some, if you were to talk to Marsha and those guys, you would, what you would find is, and what we covered is that they just invent all kinds of procedural red tape to stop you, to dampen you, to stop you from having the opportunity to say what you're saying, to get you to a trit, to quit, and to just basically make it impossible for you to make your point to any audience that would ever matter. Especially when they're in the middle of lying about being a Calvinist and they're being called out on it. And then they'll accuse you, you're accusing God's anointed. Don't receive an accusation against an elder. They'll try all this kind of stuff. So what is tone policing? They'll, they'll do this a lot. I have this thing in my notes. A tone argument is a type of ad hominem argument aimed at the tone of an argument instead of its factual or logical content in order to dismiss a person's argument. Ignoring the truth or falsity of a statement, a tone argument instead focuses on the emotion with which it is expressed. So they're basically like dogs. You get a dog and if you, you know, you, it's all about the tone when you're talking to a dog. You could say, come here, I'm going to give you a treat and it's going to be wonderful. And they're going to cower and, you know, hide from you in the corner. But if you say, oh, come here, we're going to go out back and we're going to shoot you in the head. And that, they'll just come up and wag their tail. They have no idea what you're saying. It's all about how you're saying it. Okay. And when these, the tone police are basically devolved down to the level of animals. And we have some people at this channel sometimes, they think that I'm, I'm a little too harsh with my language. I come across too harsh. I would, I would share your videos with people, but you just, you're just too harsh on the Calvinists and I can't share it because of your language. So your, your friends are dogs. That's the problem. Okay. Now I'm a retired military officer. I've been deployed twice and I'm used to having to talk to infantrymen, soldiers of all different kinds medics who have, you know, put their friends to bed with a shovel, uh, lawyers, doctors, dentists, firemen, policemen, uh, you know, people who actually live out there in the real world who need to hear things straight, okay? So that's the kind of people that I'm used to having to talk to. And this, like, people, snowflake generation that grew up tending to house plants, barefooted and all this kind of stuff, it's like weird. And then they want me to be like all kind and gentle for them. Okay. Well, you just change the channel. Just go somewhere else. Okay. I can make a couple of recommendations. <laughs> there's, there's some other, uh, you know, anti-Calvinism channels that are out there that you'd probably love, but it's not going to be here. Okay. So if you're like, if, if you've got the same problem as a dog and you need it to be toned a certain way, just go somewhere else. Okay. You're not going to get that kind of stuff here. We're not going to do that. So the tone police argument is not a good argument. So what do you see? You see a dismissal of, a, of an emotional response. You get dismissed because of an emotional response. You're too angry or emotional. Or you called me names. Or are you suggesting I'm not saved? It goes back to this idea of Christian political correctness. Now, the biggest problem with Christian political correctness like the big cardinal sin is that you're not allowed to suggest or the or hint at all that someone else's Christianity might not be genuine. Um, now, I agree that you should not automatically... Re That's another thing, no true Scotsman fallacy, okay? I agree that you should not use that as an argumentative ploy. But when it comes to examining data, for example, and we say, well, the gospel and scripture is this, and what you are preaching is not the gospel or is the opposite. Now, if they deduct that that means they're not true Christians, that's, I don't care. I'm still not going to hold back from saying that. Some people will hold back from saying that clearly because they're afraid of what people will deduct from it. And so I don't agree with using the no true Scotsman logical fallacy as an argumentative tactic. I think that's childish and dumb and stupid and don't do it. But at the same time, Paul was in peril among false brethren. There are, you know, devils walking around making themselves out to be angels of light. And he's afraid that, you know, in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, that you're going to give yourself over to a false spirit and a false Jesus. 
So it is possible to be swayed, to be wrong, to be following the wrong path. That, that kind of stuff is possible. And if we can't suss this out, which I don't think we have any discernment these days, I'll have to do another video on what discernment really is. Accusations of hostility. Why are you being so confrontational? Accusations of causing division. I don't know why I don't have this one in bold. I, you're sowing discord among the brethren. You're causing division. Well, let's talk about the division just for a second. You need to understand what I'm about to say. Because whenever the division and unity thing comes up, unity, the we need to all get together. That is usually spoken by people who are trying to get something over on you. They're trying to use procedural sophistry to get you to align with something you don't agree with and shut your mouth about it. That's usually the ploy. Now, we are for biblical unity. But when somebody is calling for unity, they're, they're, they're usually up to something that isn't good. Okay? And then on the division side, this, so this goes both ways. They'll both they'll both quote both sides. They'll both quote the verses that say you're supposed to have unity, and then they'll both quote the verses that says Jesus says I am not to come to bring peace but division. I'm not come to bring peace but a sword. And then Jesus says something in John seven or wherever, and it says, and there was a division among the people because of him. See, holy, righteous, spiritual people they cause division. Well, which is it? You see. So here's the deal. Expression of divergent thinking, it means I think differently than you, will always cause division and bring opposition. Always. Doesn't matter who you are. This does not mean that the divergent thinker is correct. If you're in, if you're over there in, you know, in Tibet and you're with a bunch of Buddhists and you start doing Buddhism a different way, you're going to draw you're going to, if you, if you're with a bunch of Muslims and you start doing Islam a different way, you're going to draw opposition. It doesn't mean you're correct. You see, divergent thinking brings opposition. And just because you bring opposition, because you think differently than the group does not mean you are correct. Doesn't mean they're wrong. Doesn't mean they're right. Okay. That's, that's the point you need to understand. The next thing is all propositionally reductive ideology, all of it causes division and factionalism. All of it is 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, 1 through 4. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? There's divisions and fightings among you. Or are there envyings and strife among you? James chapter 4. Okay? All propositionally reductive ideology. Calvinism, provisionism, whatever ism you're part of, causes division and factionalism, all of it. This does not make any of it true. It does not make any of it false. It's just a characteristic of propositionally reductive ideology. That's what happens with stagnant water. It suggests that it's a poor, what it does suggest is that it's a poor modality of relation, that propositionally reductive ideology, in other words, you have to agree with this statement of faith in order to join this church, that's propositionally reductive ideology. That is a bad modality of, of relating to people, of having an end group, because it always results in further factionalism, which hunts. And we've showed the chart many other times. Like There's like 30 bad things that always happen from propositionally reductive ideology. So genuine mature unity, it is non-ideological heterogeneous coherence non-ideological, heterogeneous coherence. So ideological is if you are a Calvinist or a provisionist, something like that. Non-ideological means you're metaparadigmatic. You're not beholden to any particular paradigm. You can operate outside them. You can put them on, take them back off, not be emotionally or egoically attached or identified to any of them, okay? Heterogeneous as opposed to homogeneous. A Calvinistic church, they're all, they're, they're homogeneous. They're, they're all the same. They all think the same way. They have to believe the same doctrine. Well, true unity can have coherence while you're heterogeneous. But you're also metaparadigmatic, you see? You can't be paradigmatic and heterogeneous and have coherence. You have to be 
non-ideological, metaparadigmatic, and heterogeneous, and have coherence. And that's what mature, genuine unity looks like. So this whole thing about you're causing division, you're sowing discord among the brethren. Well, any kind of divergent thinking is going to split things up. And if you're the stealth Calvinist pastor, you're the one who's actually splitting things up. The other people are just calling attention to it. And the thing that you think of as unity is a faux virtue signaled unity. It's just as fake as the Christian political correctness. And then they're going to have appeals to politeness. I'd be more inclined to listen to your argument if you weren't so impolite. I think I was supposed to say weren't right here instead of were. Uh, typo. If you weren't so impolite, I'd be more inclined. And this is often mixed with gaslighting. Like, for example, you may be perfectly polite and genuine and sincere, but frank and straightforward. And they're just going to accuse you of being impolite. Hello? Anybody had that happen? Yes. Oh, gaslighting. What is gaslighting? Gaslighting is like when you're being accused of something that you didn't really do or aren't really doing. And it they, it works on you so much to where you're like, what if I really did do that? You start to question. You start to doubt yourself. Last time we talked, you called me stupid. No, I didn't. Well, after they say that 30 times, they're like, well, what if I did call her stupid? And I just don't remember. You know, what if I was impolite and I just, you know, what if they're right? You start to question yourself. That's that's how gaslighting works, okay? <laughs> and so what they will do is they will accuse you of some kind of interactive impropriety, oftentimes that you didn't even do. They may not like something you said and they're going to assign it to something else like you're impolite or something like that. Then they're going to have minimization of your concerns. Oh, you're blowing this out of proportion. You're making such a big deal out of this. You, Debbie, you just won't quit talking about Calvinism. Why you got to make such a big deal out of this? They'll say you're making a bigger deal out of this than it needs to be. They'll focus on your manner of expression. We could take you more seriously if you didn't sound so angry. And you're like, well, I don't sound angry. Just saying things. My my wife, Paula, she is... She's a very frank person. She can she likes to slice and dice the facts and then say it exactly how she sees it. Well, people who are used to being coddled and tatat all the time, that's that's shocking to them. That's, they, they, they take that as abrasiveness when like we're used to it. We we give each other like straight up forward cutting assessments all the time because we're dealing with the facts and we're trying to optimize for time and here's how it really is. And we're trying to get things done. Well, when somebody who's being coddled and taught hot all the time gets something told to them straight, they, they think, oh, 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 he's so angry. No, I'm not angry at all. It's, it's, I hit my go fast button because we're trying to get something done. Here's the facts. Deal with this. Sort it out. Have it on my desk by 9 a.m. Whatever. We're going to look at Calvinistic manipulation. Two of these slides. I know these slides are busy and they're, they're not super fun, maybe. Well, I think they are. But they're very helpful. And you can also screenshot these, okay, so that you can get this information. So what a Calvinist is going to do, number one, doctrine over person. Now, the way we've framed that before is that like the person isn't really there. The ideology of Calvinism is going to override your personal thoughts, feelings, ideas, and sensibilities and capacity for discernment to where you outsource all of that to Calvinism rather than have any of your own. So when I ask James White what he thinks about Hebrews 7.25, I will not get James White's opinion. I will get Calvinism. Nobody knows what James White's opinion is. James White doesn't know what James White's opinion is. He doesn't have one. The personhood is gone. Speaking of the personhood being gone, we have I, we have we don't have it scheduled yet. But Doug Gustafson is going to come back on the channel soon and talk about how Calvinism takes the personhood from people. 
And that's exactly what it does. You'll notice shifting definitions when you're dealing with people who are trying to manipulate you. You'll notice a bunch of false dichotomies. You'll notice questioning as doubt. Oh, you can't question these things. You're not, like we just had Alana on yesterday, and it was very clear that she was not treated as a full citizen, if you will, when you're questioning the tulip. You're not allowed to do that. You have to be Pinocchio. You're not allowed to turn into a real boy. So Alana and Hector, they were turning into, you know, they were like Pinocchio. They're turning into a real boy. They're escaping the system. They're leaving Pleasure Island. And they're they're leaving the uh they're leaving the elephant. Okay. And then they're being treated like they're the problem when they were the only ones doing the right thing. You should be doubting things. There's spiritual elitism. We are better than you. We are the elect. You are not. Guilt by association. Oh, you can't read those books by Richard Rohr or um, what's some other stuff? Like if you happen to find, what's that woman's name? The woman preacher who's real famous. <laughs> I forget her name. If you, or Beth Moore, I think is another good one. But if you if you happen to find a woman preacher wrote a book and it is very helpful to you, you're guilty by association. Southern Baptists will put you on the stake, you know. <laughs> Guilt by association. That some people call this secondary separation. Like they only fellowship with people who are like minded, and they disfellowship with people who aren't like minded. That's called an echo chamber, by the way. And then secondary separation is even though you're like-minded, because you are fellowshipping with someone who isn't like-minded, we will also disfellowship from you. Secondary separation. Joyce Meyer. Yeah. And I've always, you know, Joyce Meyer's uh, all this kind of stuff. And then one time I opened up one of her books and read just in a bookstore, <laughs> you know, just thumbing through stuff while I was waiting for something. I was in a Christian bookstore, which we're going to do another video on that too. But just thumbing through there, reading some excerpts from her books, I found some of the stuff actually kind of insightful and kind of helpful. Doesn't mean I agree with everything that's in there. But, you know, if you want to read a Joyce Meyer book and you get something out of it, have at it. You're not going to get any flack from me. Gatekeeping salvation. Observe if a leader makes themselves or the specific interpretations gatekeepers of salvation, implying that salvation depends on adherence to their teachings or, or interpretations. Now, notice it is implying. They do not come out and say that. Okay. When I was at Fish River Baptist Church, Pastor Ron Jackson was talking about the youth pastor who was pastor before me, youth pastor before I was, whose name was Scott. And he was telling the story of how he got Scott to believe the doctrines of grace too. And then Scott came to realize that he wasn't saved. And then he finally trusted Christ for real, this kind of thing. Basically, what he's and this, this story came up in multiple various different forms at multiple various different times. And it was very strong and obvious implication that he was implying that I wasn't really saved unless I accepted the doctrines of grace. You know, the doctrine, there's no grace in Calvinism. So, <laughs> Then there's isolation. Watch for efforts to isolate followers from outside perspectives, including other Christian traditions under the guise and they'll, oh, you got to read all these books. Don't read these books. And then they'll even kick people out and they'll tell you what not to watch. Oh, you better not watch that channel beyond the fundamentals. They will, uh, they're dangerous over there. Their control over your personal convictions. Now, you, Calvin was real bad about this too. The, one of the reasons... Like a lot of us are wearing wristwatch. You know why we're wearing wristwatch, wristwatches? Is because Calvin's Geneva will not allow jewelry. And so the reason the Swiss became so good at making, became so well known for making watches is because they still wanted to wear something that looked good and had some bling to it. But the fact that it was a clock on their wrist was what justified it as not being jewelry. And like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess we'll allow that. So then since you couldn't wear jewelry you could wear wristwatches <laughs> so that start that kind of thing with the controlling everybody's personal convictions and then moral overburdening be aware of tactics that overburden individuals with a sense of moral inadequacy or failure not living up to the leader's specific theological moral standards 
often leading to cycles of guilt and dependence on the leader for their assurance. And uh, see, they need external validation from you because they're narcissistic and they want to condition you to need external validation from them in order to feel like you're a whole person and in right standing with God. So there is this two-way kind of, uh, they want they want to have a codependency with you. They want to establish a codependency with you. And that's manipulative as well. And you don't realize that it's happening, but people under these kinds of narcissistic pastors will find themselves eager to maintain, gain and maintain the favor of the narcissistic pastors. And that's how they control people. Got this codependency going on. You'll notice selective scripture use. You'll notice that they have unchallengeable authority. You'll notice that there is spiritual gaslighting. Observe, for instance, where your feelings, experiences, or observations are dismissed or are invalidated using religious language, making you doubt your own perceptions or your own spiritual journey. We saw that happen to Debbie and Marsha, sending them around to these emails. Oh, you haven't been to seminary, have you? I guess you just don't know anything. Emphasis on divine mystery. Public shaming. Okay? Exclusivity and salvation. Got to go through them to get it. It's implication. It's subtle. You see? It's subtle. An overemphasis on predestination and sovereignty and that sort of stuff. Simplification of complex issues. I heard a definition of a cult the other day or, or a description of how they get started by a, from a lawyer who was featured in one of these cult expose documentaries that me and Paula were watching. Paula and I were watching. And the lawyer said cults are started when people fall are willing to accept simple answers for complex problems. And I've, I heard that. I'm like, that is exactly right. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, if people don't want to spend that cognitive horsepower to really dig into something and to really understand it, I can just give you a bunch of moralistic beliefs to hang on to. Turn it all over on God. And that's that's what's happening there when people are railing against me because some of my lingo sounds as if it's psychological or something like that. The The deal is they don't want to spend the the cognitive horsepower to really understand. Now, notice I'm morally framing this. You see that? I said they don't want to. You hear that? I am morally framing this. But <laughs> they don't want to spend the more the cognitive horsepower to find out what's really going on or that seems very daunting and it's very easy to just offload all of that onto some religious magical thinking it's very simple it's very easy religious magical thinking is very easy and i can feel moral for believing and trusting i just trust in god brother i don't need to know all of that psychological stuff i know i know you know Message me back after your, you know, kids are coming out of jail and getting divorced and everything else because that's what's coming. Don't you understand? I'm trying to help you guys. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you avoid the dysfunction that I know is coming your way and that you can't see because you are blind. I'm trying to get you to see more clearly. That's what I'm trying to do. I care about you. I don't want you to make the mistakes that I made. And if you keep down this path of pushing off things that seem complicated and difficult because you feel more moral and superior for putting it all on God, and it's simpler that way. Yeah, it's it's simpler until it's not. And one day it's going to be so complex, you're not going to know what to do about it, and you're going to bar be buried in problems up to your eyeballs, for which you're not going to be have any kind of solution for them. Alana just said that she morally framed something in our interview last night. I caught myself as I listened back today. Yeah, and so it's so subtle. We'll notice ourselves doing it without even realizing that we're doing it. Reliance on charismatic persuasion. Oh, it came from John MacArthur, and he's just so holy and wonderful. Observe if a leader relies more on their personal charisma or emotional appeal rather than scripture. Reasoning on the testimony of the broader Christian community throughout history. So you can look at people like James White. He uh, he uh, he says things loudly and forcefully, 
which causes a bunch of Calvinists who want some kind of champion to glom onto him, right? That doesn't make him right at all. There's uh, nobody with a high epistemic threshold of proof will spend more than 10 seconds listening to somebody with James White. You can tell he's full of beans quickly when you start listening to him. And then alienation from the church is what happens. It's funny. You say all these things all lined up like this. I asked chat GPT. I did. I plugged all this information in there. I said, based on what we have talked about and what we know, give me a 10, 10 ways that Calvinists will use moralistic manipulation. And now give me 10 more. And the chat GPT knows Calvinists do this. I want to mitigate for subtlety. There's implicit assumptions. What are those implicit assumptions? Right now I'm putting some slides together for a biblical interpretation course. And there is an implicit assumption. I wonder if I have those slides nearby. There's an implicit assumption that there is some kind of systematic theology, like some kind of mythological, magical, systematic theology up in heaven somewhere that's already been all sorted out. And that somehow that was in the minds of the apostles when they were writing. And they were writing in service to this mythological, magical, systematic theology. And then they gave us this jumbled mess that's called the Bible that nobody can figure out, nobody can interpret. And it creates, you know, hundreds of thousands of denominations because nobody can agree on everything. But it is our job as humans to try to use that jumbled mess of the Bible that God gave us and then reassemble the mythological systematic theology that uh, is up in heaven kept secret in a safe somewhere that, that all the apostles had in their mind and were writing in service to. So when, whenever somebody says, huh, whenever somebody says the Bible teaches, that is the underlying assumption. All of that is the underlying assumption. Now, when you hear that assumption, you're like, that's absurd. That sounds stupid. Right, because I've brought it to the surface. The reason it's subtle and the reason it works with people is because it's under the surface. It's subtle. People don't know that it's there. So underlying implicit assumptions, language connotations, looking for words with connotations that subtly guide emotional reactions and moral judgments. These might not be overtly emotional or loaded terms, but can carry implicit judgments or associations. Questioning the frame. You consider what perspectives or alternatives are being excluded when something's being presented to you. And we, we could give all kinds of examples of all of these. Like when, you know, when Calvinism is railing against, you know, Bethel and whatever else they rail against, that they're not telling you all of the other options that are out there. They're just like, well, in order, the only way to avoid, you know, the error of Bethel is to come to us. What's being left out? Identify patterns over time. Subtle manipulation may not be evident in a single statement or action, but becomes apparent through cons consistent patterns in language, topic selection, or portrayal of issues over time. So if you're watching for sermon series, you, you can piece together that, oh, this guy has a five-year plan to turn this church into a Calvinist church. Put that together over time. Number five, checking for consistency, looking for inconsistencies in the words and actions and performative contradictions as well. Number six, analyze the context. What's the context of this? Understand the broader context in which the statements are made can reveal subtle biases and manipulations. One of the things about perspectival awareness and perspectival capacity, okay, which really starts to mature around stage five, is the ability to zoom in close on an idea and topic and then to zoom in out. And you can zoom in close with data like the, the book of the Bible, you can consider all of the information front to back. You can zoom in close and zoom out with regard to space. Like I'm in Baton Rouge. Let me zoom out and see Louisiana. Let me zoom out and see the United States. Let me zoom out and see the Western Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere. See, let me zoom out and see planet Earth. Zooming in, zooming out spatially and then time-wise, okay? I'm right here right now. Let's zoom out 
What do thing what did things look like 50 years ago? What will things look like in 50 years? What did things look like a thousand years ago? What will things look like in a thousand years? Zooming out time-wise, zooming in time-wise. What how am I going to spend my next hour and a half? Okay. Where where's mankind going to be in the next 2,000 years? See, it's a very different kind of thing just to zoom in and zoom out a little bit. Somebody mentioned the no true Scotsman fallacy. There's emotional undercurrents. Even when not overtly emotional, the way arguments are presented can play on deeper emotional undercurrents or societal fears and aspirations. Identifying these can reveal a subtle manipulative intent. Omission. This is a big one. Notice what's not being said. Subtle manipulation often involves omitting certain facts, perspectives, or considerations that would lead to a more balanced or nuanced understanding. Um uh, like like opposing perspectives or uh, complementary or supplementary perspectives also. <clears throat> and then audience targeting. Consider how the framing might be tailored to appeal to specific fears, values, or biases of the intended audience, manipulating their perceptions or reactions in a way that seems natural or self-evident. When we watch all of these guys who are targeting these non-Calvinist churches and trying to turn them into Calvinist churches, okay? Notice that they're they're looking for a very particular thing. They're actually looking for the same kind of thing that the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses are looking for. The Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses have identified Southern Baptists as like the easiest group of people who are already religious that can be targeted for conversion to their, you know, religious group. And why is that? Okay, what is the weakness that's there? You notice how what the the history of the reformers, according to them, they were reforming the Catholic Church. Well, why did they stop doing that? See, the Catholic Church is still here. Why aren't they infiltrating Catholic churches? Okay, then what they're doing is they have a very specific audience they're targeting. If there's an audience that says. Oh, we don't believe in work salvation. Oh, I can use that phrase and I can twist that and then I can do equivocation and bait and switch and then swap out the works for faith. And actually, when we we they both use the same phrase, we don't believe in work salvation, but what the what you find out the hard way is what the Calvinist really means is they don't believe in salvation by faith because they say faith is a work and if and if you have to have faith to be saved, that's like having to have a work to be saved. Therefore, you believe in work salvation. Therefore, we have to have regeneration preceding faith, or you believe in work salvation. That kind of thing. Well, Southern Baptists who don't know their Bible and don't have a high threshold of epistemic proof requirements, they can be manipulated like that. Okay. And other people have institutional like the independent Baptists, it's real hard to manipulate them like that because they know their Bible a lot better. Uh, the Catholics, it's harder to uh, reform and manipulate them because they have institutional guardrails in place. Okay? And the uh, Southern Baptists are, we just let them in. Oh, we're all part of the same crew. <laughs> the fox is into the hen house. And then also seeking multiple perspectives. Exposing yourself to a variety of viewpoints can also be very helpful in mitigating the subtlety of all the stuff that goes on. 